Okay, so hello and a warm welcome to uh, all the panelists and all the participants who gathered here. It is a great pleasure to introduce this book launch um, at the democracy, at CEU's Democracy Institute. Book launches are always fun. They're always celebrations. And this book is especially uh, uh, dear to me because um, it was at least co-edited by Dori Redai, who uh, was my PhD student and who wrote her PhD on, on this topic. So I'm particularly proud, um, proud, of, proud of this book, but of course, she's not the only co-editor. The book is entitled um, Gender Equality and Stereotyping in Secondary Schools, and it was published by uh, Paul Grave in its um, Gender and Education series. Um, so my job as a as a, and, and somebody who introduces this is to be brief, um, but also to um, to introduce the panelists. So let me quickly uh, give you some background on the people who you will be hearing from. Uh, first, our moderator is uh, Gita Ludra, who is a lecturer in education at Mel University. She is an academic. She's also a practitioner and an activist, all combined. Um, she has a background in primary school teaching, which I consider heroic nowadays. Um, she also has an academic interest in post-colonial models of education and um, uh, has done a wide range of political activities, including um, leading a community social enterprise, the DEMA CIC, if I pronounce that correctly, where she advocates for Black, Indigenous, and people of color in outdoor spaces. Um, this, then, and then let me go um, on to talk a bit to give you some background on the speakers. So Dorotia Reda is an independent scholar affiliated with the CEU the Democracy Institute. Her research interests include gender equality in education as well as sex education and anti-gender education policies and politics in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, she also works as an activist and as a trainer for Labris Lesbian Association in Hungary. And she is the coordinator of the internationally renowned a fairy tale for everyone book project for which she was named one of the 100 most influential people in the world in 2021 i was extremely proud um, i do think that that's a wonderful achievement no matter what um, and i hope that she will be able to influence a lot of people um, in the way that she's going next arita soberai and i uh, apologize if I didn't get this right, uh, who is a global citizenship education specialist and has worked in a number of educational fields as an education officer and as a trainer. She is currently at the Global Citizenship Education Lead in Oxfam, Italy, and contributes to developing, monitoring, and evaluating educational programs focused on active and global citizenship education. And last but not least, Maria Tsurufli. <laughs> My apologies, Maria. Who's a no, it's perfect, perfect, perfect. <laughs> who's a professor of education and director of research at Brunel University in London. She founded and leads the Intercultural Interculturality for Diversity and Global Learning Research Group at Brunel. Her research explores the interface of gender and professional identities and policy implications in secondary, higher, and medical education in European countries. So welcome, everybody. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. And I, I warmly congratulate you on the book and uh, because uh, uh, write, not, not only writing, but editing books um, is also a, a heroic activity. And I do think that this is um, um, a major, a, an important contribution uh, to this field. And I wish you a great luck. And I hope that you'll have lots and lots of people reading it and discussing it uh, from now until the end of times. And now let me give the floor to uh, Gita, who is going to be moderating the event. And I'll just be in the background and, and listen. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, first of all, for inviting me this evening. Hope you can all hear me. So first of all, I just want to hold up the book and feel it and just say what a privilege it is to hold the book in my hand. And it holds a very special place on my bookshelf. So as a mother of two daughters and about to become a grandmother in a few weeks to a granddaughter, I feel this book is really close to my heart. Um, so I've spent yesterday and most of today reading it. And as I was reading it, I really thought about the future generation of women that are going to enter my family and how they're going to be educated in schools and felt very emotional about the curriculum that my daughters have both had, having spoken to them today about it, and kind of, you know, living in hope for the future curricula that my future granddaughters will hopefully have. 
So first of all, thank you. It's been a privilege to have this book. It's just a shame that I didn't have this book a couple of months ago because myself and my colleagues would have been using it on a module that we're currently delivering. Um, so it's a very special book. Um, it's timely. It's an important book on gender equality and gender stereotyping across England, Hungary and Italy. And that makes this book incredibly unique. The case study approach provides rich, critical food for thought for a range of educational stakeholders and establishments. It touches, for example, on gendered environmental factors which I've struggled to find work on that, to be honest. I think that's quite novel how the authors have done that and how schools can configure and critically reflect on unbiased physical spaces, how they're constructed and navigated by pupils in schools. It looks at gender-based violence and curriculum intent, delivery and resources to include dimensions <coughs> of extracurricular activities as well. It refreshingly draws on a critical intersectional lens by leading authors in this field. And as I read the book today, as I've already said, <clears throat> my hope would be that all teacher educational courses embed some of the findings and principles in their modules as compulsory teaching and learning. And it kind of made me reflect on the teacher education courses that I've worked on and do currently work on and examine as an external examiner. And I really do think this should be essential reading. It should lead to some work where students have to submit a piece of work which connects to an area of this. It also made me think of some of Bell Hooks's work, the late respected Bell Hooks, teaching to transgress and her critical lens. Um, so I felt quite emotional as I was reading parts of it. And I've actually situated it on my bookshelf uh, um, within Bell, next to Bell Hooks's work, because I think as I've got to know the authors over some Zoom meetings, and um, you know, it's been, it's, it's felt like a real privilege to own this book, as I've said. Um, I think student teachers, if we embed this into our teacher education courses in particular, I think we'll have student teachers who are going to become critical agents of change in the schools and educational establishments that they work in. I just felt a little bit jealous that there wasn't a primary equivalent. So just a little nod to the authors, maybe you need a follow up um, for primary colleagues as well. So much jumped out to me in this book. I mean, I could take up an hour zoom on to, into it, but it really touched on my doctoral research with British South Asian adolescent girls in secondary schools, where I looked at Hindu, Sikh and Muslim girls from those religious backgrounds. And I really welcomed the point on gendered inequalities and stereotypes as issues mainly discussed in relation to ethnic minority students. And it raised important points on stereotyping in relation to cultural and religious identities. And chapter four did that beautifully. Um, and where it touched on the religion and gender are not homogenous categories, and it critically unpicked that. And it made me think about, think about some of the Muslim girls that I've interviewed in secondary schools, and actually how some of them were involved in critical feminist circles of study where they were educating their parents and families on feminism. So I really welcome that criticality there. It talks about this perpetuation in schools of essentialist discourses around gender. And it really, again, made me think about some of the school leaders um, the school advisors who talk to girls about career choices and curriculum choices. Um, this book needs to be read not only by teachers, but anyone giving those pieces of advice to girls and boys in schools. The book raises important questions about curriculum choices 
And is there, are we, you know, are we living in this gender equal world? And it was really interesting to read some of the pupils viewpoints on that as well in the rich case studies. Yes, there is a need for gender equality teaching in schools. We are not living in a gender equal society. And I can tell you that as somebody who's done research in secondary schools, as a mother of daughters, um, and as I'm someone who visits schools, there is a need. And what this book does so beautifully, um, and in a challenging way, it moves beyond the superficial and it encourages all of us who are involved in education to kind of get a little bit uncomfortable, even those who are in teacher education, myself and my colleagues, one who couldn't be here today, but Val Beer Core, who's in the audience today, we've just been writing a module on culturally responsive teaching this year, decolonizing the curriculum, a gender inclusive curriculum, and already this year, we've noticed the discomfort from schools in some of this and how some of our student teachers have come back to us and said, actually, our schools are very inclusive. Our schools are saying we don't need this because we're already very inclusive. So I think it raises questions that unless we address this at grassroots level in schools, as communities, as families, in religious spaces, we are not going to move on. What I also really liked in this book is it spelt out in black and white that we've got to move beyond equal opportunities policies. Yes, they're a good starting point, but we need gender equality specific plans. Hallelujah. Yes, we absolutely do need them. And we need those gender equality specific plans through a critical intersectional lens. And this book addresses that. I thought the appendices were brilliant and myself and my colleagues will be using them in our teaching next year. And I will be sharing them with any schools that I go into. What I really liked about the appendices is you've got the gender equality checklist to help schools audit whereabouts they think they are. And it's done in a non-threatening way. So it's not grading where you are. It's kind of saying, here's some characteristics. Where do you think you sit? And the continuum approach is really helpful so that it's visionary, it's forward looking, and schools could think, right, these are the next steps. This is where we're, see this is where we're sitting, and this is where we want to be and where we want to move to. And it looks at the ethos and environment, which I think is really important. I think ethos and environment, the physical environment is often dismissed. And I think that's a really unique selling point in this book. And it looks at curriculum content as well. I think the glossary, the gender equality glossary and the language glossary, the guidance at the back of the book is really, really helpful because Based on my experience with student teachers and teachers in schools and family, people are really confused around this and they need help. So that I think is going to increase teacher confidence and anybody who is working in educational fields. Overall, I mean, I don't wanna take up too much airspace. You've probably already gathered that I'm in love with this book. I really am. It's a special book on my bookshelf. It sits on the shelf where my Bell Hooks books are. And I feel priv privileged to own a copy of it. Um, and I really, really hope that this book has a sequel as well. Um, I'm sure the authors are exhausted, but I think a sequel is definitely needed. And I think there's some rich training opportunities for the authors to work in schools across a range of countries now. So thank you very much for inviting me um, and I'll hand back now. Thank you, Gita. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is very emotional to put our book next to Bear Hook's book. I mean, I also got very <laughs> emotional when you said that. <laughs> and thank you for, for all these wonderful words. 
<laughs> so it was worth it, Maria, you see. <laughs> um, <laughs> I thought Kita was the best person actually to, to do this uh, review or introduction because <laughs> I mean yeah, she okay. combines you know a commitment to feminist um, research, uh, a new sense understanding of gender and gender equality in schools, and her practitioner experience as actually as as a teacher. So I think she was probably yeah. a position person um, to um, to act as moderator today. So thank you. I mean. <laughs> uh, Dory and I feel very, very privileged, and I don't think we could have had a more uh, complimentary account of the book. Oh, well, it really was, um, it really, and I really mean that from the bottom of my heart. I've spent my day off today reading it, and it's been an absolute privilege to read it. Um, so I think I'm on, I've done my reflections on the book. Would you like me to promote, um, ask some questions now or would you like to do a different order uh maybe a bit later i yes. think uh it would be useful for the audience to to give a little bit of an mm -hmm. introduction about the project and that would be good the book yeah. as well yeah. and then i think that all three of us areta maria and, and myself could talk a little bit about like the 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 part of the book that we were most involved in, so like the the English, the Italian and Hungarian research and work with the schools, and then then could come questions, yep. both from you, Gita, and then from the audience in the oh, end. Yeah. Okay. Great, that's great. Okay, so I'll just I'll, I'll make a start, and um, I'll talk very briefly about um, the project. I mean, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone. I'd like to thank Dory and the Institute of Democracy for hosting us. I'd like to thank uh, Eva Fyodor. I'd like to thank everyone, really, who has attended today, but also everyone who has participated in this uh, project. Uh, so just to say a little bit about the background, because it was uh, a very challenging enterprise doing this book and bringing everybody together. So first of all, um, I'd like to thank um, Horizon 2020, um, Rights, Equality and Citizenship Programme, which funded the project. So this was a 36-month project, which did not focus only on research. So research was just one aspect of the project. Okay? So the project uh, was entitled Developing Gender Equality Charter Marks to Overcome Gender Stereotyping in Education um, across three, three countries, England, uh, Hungary and, and Italy. So... Uh, we were, the project was led by uh, Dexy Sheffield, an educational organization. Helen Griffin and Clive Belgian uh, represented uh, Dexy. Uh, Dory uh, Redai from, from Hungary, Valentina Gereni from Italy, and also Oxfam with uh, Aretha Sobera today here with us. Um, Ray, Rahel Katalin Turai also was involved in the, in the book, in, in writing one of the chapters with Dory. Balaj Naji and uh, Victoria Mihalkov from Hungary and um, Anthropolis. So it was a collaboration between NGOs and universities and a collaboration across three countries. So um, the project brought together countries, but also researchers, uh, academics and practitioners with very different experiences, um, very different academic cultural backgrounds, and, and different languages. So coming together for the project was a challenge and coming together to write a book was again, you know, an even bigger challenge. And, and I'll, I'll have, I hope I'll have the chance to talk more about that um, later. But just to say very briefly, because I know Dory is going to introduce um, the chapters briefly, um, just, just to say that our intellectual, our, um, sorry, our framework, our analytical uh, framework, was the gender regime and also intersectionality framework. I mean, we were very interested to know how gender intersected with other strands of diversity. And we didn't set out you know, to do research with specific, um, aiming to explore specific strands, but we were open. We wanted to see what would become prevalent in the field and across within and across different countries. And again, I hope I'll have a chance to talk more uh, more about that um, later. So yes, I'd like to thank everyone for their contributions. As I said, it has been 
a challenging project for all sorts of reasons, uh, because we work at, across country, we ha countries, we had to negotiate even, you know, language and understandings and develop shared understandings of gender and gender equality, and while at the same time maintaining, um, you know, uh, the, the, the difference and the wealth and the breadth of knowledge that each country brought into the, the project and also each individual, uh, whether practitioner or academic, brought into the project. But hopefully Hopefully I'll have a chance to talk more about these um, later and I'll, you know, hand over to Dory now who's going to say a little bit more about um, um, the book and the chapter. So just to give a, um, an overview really uh, of the book. Mm -hmm. and then okay, uh, before I tell you about the chapters, I would just like to very briefly explain what is a gender equality charter mark, because that's what the whole project is about. It's um, it's um. It's a tool, it's a measuring tool for schools to, to research and understand how gender relations and gender equality is in their particular school. So it's a school level uh, measuring tool. And, and it looks at various aspects of, of, um, <clears throat> of gender equality on various levels. So, uh, which means that, um, let me just, I have to, so, so there are um, a number of headings in the chart, in the, in the GECM framework. Uh, it looks at uh, school leadership, it looks at the curriculum, it looks at the physical environment of the school, it looks at attitudes and relationships as they are uh, shaped by, by gender, and it looks uh, at the community uh, meaning uh, the families of students, uh, links with, with feeder schools, colleges, and, and also uh, links with, with um, organizations that provide external educational programs for the schools. And uh, so these are the main fields that it looks at. And, <clears throat> and it's, it's a measuring tool, so it, it has, a, um, it looks, at these headings that I mentioned on the level of, of the leadership, on the level of teachers and on the level of students. And there are four categories, um, which are, uh, the first one is, is kind of entry level. So those schools uh, that already sense that the gender relations, gender equality is an issue, they, they might have some ideas and then the bronze level is um, where there are individual uh, teachers who, who do work, who do some work on, on, on gender and gender equality. And then there's um, um, the silver level where, where this work is more organized, more uh, day, part of the everyday um, practice of teaching and then school, school life. Teachers might work together. There are uh, um, initiations from the management to deal with gender equality. And the gold level is when, when it's a whole school practice. So, uh, and, and whole school approach is, is, is one of the keywords in this project because the, 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 aim, of, of, uh, the aim would be to, to involve the whole school on every every level that I mentioned to involve the leadership, the teachers, the students, all these fields, you know, the curriculum, the <clears throat> relationships, the space, uh, to have working polic policies and working uh, practices on the school level to, to uh, improve gender equality in schools. So what gender equality charter mark does is to to measure these, these various fields and levels and groups in the school with, with questions asked uh, and suggestions made. So it, it's quite useful because then it, can, it can give ideas to, to the school management and teachers about how to go on to improve uh, gender equality in the schools. Uh, at the back of the book, you can find um, <clears throat> these gender equality charter mark marks and also I think Areta when she's later going to show the website uh, she, she will show this because they are also there 
And um, <clears throat> so that's what the gender equality charter mark is. And um, I'll show you the show you the chapters. I'll share my screen in a second. Just go back to the content parts. Yeah, and I just briefly introduced them in a, in a few sentences. Can I just add very briefly, um, Dory? Yeah. That, I mean, the way we use the uh, the charter marks was was enabling rather than disabling. So we didn't use them in a restrictive way, and they were not in a restrictive way actually to put barriers into schools. It was just it's just a, an audit tool really that can help encourage uh, schools and inspire schools to engage with gender equality. And like everything else and all the gender accreditation, gender equality accreditation schemes and race quality accreditation schemes, it comes, it comes with challenges, of course, and it's very much uh, a contingent uh, sp um, sp specific, specific, sorry, to space and um, another issue. So, I, I mean, again, we'll have a chance to talk about that um, later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. That's that's very important. That it's it's not so, it's not something we we didn't mean to grade the schools and you know, but but to show them, you know, chances of improving their yeah. their overall <clears throat> gender relations. Okay, so there are um, eight chapters, and the first one is is an introductory chapter where we explain the project and. And we explain the country context a little bit. Uh, and then in the second, second chapter, we talk about um, the charter mark. What is a charter mark? How it came about? How, how we worked uh, with the schools on the charter mark? Then in the third one, we describe the research methodology because the project had uh, various parts. Um, so the first part was... Um, we tried to put together a kind of uh, draft for the charter mark uh, together with, with teachers. So we involved teachers all through the process from the beginning. And in this first stage, when we sat down to put together a, um, a draft for, for the charter mark, and brainstorm ideas about how it could be, uh, everyone participated. So the researchers and, and, and uh, the education experts from the NGOs and uh, teachers, uh, representatives of, of the pilot schools that we work together later. And then the next stage was that, that uh, the researchers, three of us, uh, Valentina, who unfortunately cannot be here, and Maria and myself, uh, we went to three pilot schools per country and we did uh, <clears throat> baseline uh, data collection, qualitative collection. We interviewed teachers uh, individually, and then we had focus groups with students. Uh, and we followed the, the, the themes of the charter mark uh, in the interview uh, topics. Uh, so we got a lot of information, uh, which we could later work into the, into the, the charter marks. And then <clears throat> the, the next three chapters, four, five, and, and six are the kind of the country chapters. So chapter four was written by Maria uh, and she, she describes and, and analyzes the, the data, the, the baseline uh, data that she collected in the English schools. In the fifth uh, chapter, um, <clears throat> Turai Katain, Rahel and myself, uh, analyze the Hungarian data and, and uh, you know, what, what happened in Hungarian schools. And in the sixth chapter, uh, the Italian uh, situation is analyzed. And then in the seventh uh, chapter, uh, we had this, uh, a next stage when after uh, piloting the, um, the charter mark in each school, uh, we we got some feedback from, feedback from the teachers and and students about what changes were made as a result of introducing or piloting the the charter mark 
and we reflect on we re we re reflect on this process and, and and the feedback we got from teachers and students and and the last chapter is a conclusion where we try to take uh, <clears throat> our findings further and and reflect on our experiences and and try to <clears throat> appoint further lines for for uh, for going further with, with this charter mark project and then the appendices which Gita adored so much <laughs> we have we have this gender equality checklist for secondary schools there's a gender equality glossary uh, guidelines for for gender sensitive or gender neutral language um, yeah, gender equality checklists for books. So the, these are things that teachers can can use in their own work, and and then then the and this is contained the Hungarian, the Italian, and the English gender equality charter mark. The three charter marks are quite different. Uh, the, so the topics are the same and the levels and the and the groups, but um, <clears throat> but we try to adapt. Um, the charter marks to to the national context because they are <clears throat> three very different national contexts and educational contexts as well so <clears throat> so they look different in many senses and i think that that was uh, one of the important things in this project to figure out how how uh, you know school contexts in one country makes uh makes it necessary to to really adapt the original idea to to fit to, to make sense um, because in Hungarian schools for example um, there are a lot of uh, English expressions or or um, like ideas about gender equality that 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 are not necessarily the fitting for the for the Hungarian context um, so, so we, we, we did quite a lot of work on, on trying to contextualize and adapt uh, our own charter mark. <clears throat> so Dor that's the content of the book. Yeah, thanks. Yeah? Dor can I just, if I may very briefly also say that, uh, you know, adaptability and flexibility were extremely important for these uh, projects. As I said earlier, research was one aspect of the work, okay? So, I mean, quite a lot of our time and efforts went into actually, you know, bringing people together, bringing the different stakeholders together to develop the gender equality charter mark and adapt it. And even prior to that, um, we did, that was one of the deliverables actually of the project, uh, Horizon 20. 2020 funded project we had to uh, to do uh, an international literature review and also a national literature review so i had leading responsibility for that and also for the research uh, so but as i said research was just one aspect of the work um, so we had to adapt i mean we had to adapt as doris said the um, the charter map to the needs um, and uh, you know the context of each country, and um, also we had to adapt uh, several you know stay well several uh, elements of the project. Like for example, uh, I mean initially uh, we had written into the project an evaluation, but obviously we were not able to do one of the you know what is strictly what strictly constitutes an evaluation because you know within two years. Uh, it was extremely difficult for schools to have achieved a million things. So there was very little to, to evaluate. I mean, you know, we had to be very pragmatic and we had to be very realistic. So, I mean, we did go back to the schools um, to see where they were, you know, what they had achieved. But we did that again, you know, with, with, with an understanding and awareness of the complexities of school life and the challenges of school life. Um, just one other thing I want to, I think, you know, we're very privileged today because we have, um, we have Kelly with us, who was actually one of the teachers who participated, uh, actively participated in the development of the gender equality charter, Mark. So um, she's, you know, she's got the insider knowledge. I don't know if there's anything you might want to say, Kelly, at some point, but anyway, we're, we're delighted to have you here with us. Uh, thank you. <laughs> no, I'm happy to be here. I mean, it's I was only involved on a small in a small part, so it's weird to see how this has ballooned, um, which is really exciting. So I'm really happy to be here. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I suggest that now we we talk a little bit about our our um, country work. So our own work with with the with the three schools in the country and. Um, I don't know who would like to start. Maybe Areta, you haven't spoken, so why don't you start? <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Dori. Uh, and also from uh, from my side, I wanted to to thank uh, you, uh, Maria, for this great opportunity to be able to contribute to this book. Um, Gita, a wonderful introduction, really um, uh, incredible uh, words from you, uh, and uh, of course to. Um, uh, to to uh, uh, to Eva for for be, for hosting us uh, uh, today. Um, so as uh, I, I feel a little bit in the minority here because uh, I'm not part of uh, I'm not I don't work in, in a university. Uh, I'm not a teacher. Um, uh, I work in an NGO. I work in Oxfam uh, in in Oxfam Italy. So uh, we were um, a different kind of partner in this. Uh, in this in this project right from the beginning um, I also wanted to, to thank many of, uh, of my colleagues in, in Oxfam Italy who uh, have supported um, me in, in this work I, I was uh, part of the project right from the beginning and and uh, and have been in also in the second phase because there has been a second phase of the project as well um, and Gita will be happy to know that in the second phase we did work with primary schools so it is quite possible that there will be a sequel to this <laughs> to this book um, and also to my colleagues at the University of Florence because we work very closely together especially with uh, Irene Biemi at the beginning uh, who is a, a well-known uh, scholar on uh, gender issues especially with, uh, uh, with <clears throat> excuse me with uh, with um, in schools uh, and in primary and pre-primary schools uh, uh, she also writes uh, children's books with a gender sensitive uh, lens uh, for very young uh, children and my colleague Valentina Guerrini who I'm sorry um, has not joined us today um, but we have uh, worked very closely uh, very closely together um, whilst I'm speaking uh, I just wanted to um, uh, get my uh, very uh, it's not a really a presentation I mean it is a presentation but it's just for you to actually see something rather than just watching uh, uh, watching me all the time um, so I just wanted to um, uh, share with you a, a very few slides okay uh, just whilst I'm speaking um, we started um, this work in 2017 um, in the summer of 2017 and back then the situation in Italy in terms of uh, looking at gender issues in school was very ugly. It was a very tense climate. Um, there was um, a lot of uh, misinformation um, uh, about uh, what in Italian is called la teoria di gender. So there was a, the use of the English word, uh, which frightened everyone also. Um, and there was, um, it was being mani manipulated by uh, certain um, religious and, and right-wing groups um, to warn schools and to warn parents about the dangers of talking about gender equality issues in schools. Um, because um, what they were saying uh, was that uh, especially external collaborators to schools like NGOs um, were bringing in this uh, gender theory, uh, which would um, promote um, uh, homosexuality to children, cross-dressing as normal, uh, substituting sex with gender, um, the notion that same-sex families uh, are the same as uh, other families. So all of this was seen in a very negative way. Uh, and uh, it created, um, uh, as you can probably imagine, a context which was not easy to work uh, in. Uh, and I think Hungary, uh, unfortunately, has uh, similar, if not um, much worse, a context today. Um, and, and probably Dori will talk about this later. Um, despite this context, we didn't find uh, it difficult at all to find three pilot schools. So this was a very, very positive um, aspect. Um, the teachers, especially who were involved in, in, the, in the project right from the beginning, were very uh, much aware of the enormous difficulties which plagued and still plague schools uh, regarding gender equalities. Um, Gita mentioned, you know, the fact that, that, that 
that there isn't gender equality in schools. And, and I, I, I would agree from the experience we had. Um, these gender equalities, some of them, uh, which were very kind of prominent in Italy, were connected to the fact that um, there's a lack of a recent uh, legislation and indications for school to be working on uh, gender issues. Uh, the last law to mention anything to do with gender equality was passed in 2015, um, although there hasn't really been any kind of concrete uh, indications of, of how teachers and schools can, uh, can, can look at uh, gender equality. At the same time, uh, this um, th this law um, w w uh, also suggested, even though it was trying to uh, prevent, especially uh, gender discrimination and and, and gender based violence in schools, um, it suggested not to use the term gender uh, as it uh, leads to misunderstanding. So you can imagine that uh, there are many issues that are still um, uh, you know very critical to to deal with. Uh, no compulsory teaching. Uh, teacher training, sorry, uh, in terms of, of gender issues. Um, the significant division between boys and girls in, in terms of the disciplines, uh, sorry, the, the, um, the subjects and the schools that they choose um, is, um, is, is extremely uh, conditioned by, um, by stereotypes. Um, uh, and um, there is a high level of uh, gender discrimination, uh, violence, bullying, cyberbullying, uh, which is going on in schools, um, insensitive gender language, which is being used, um, and uh, gender bias or stereotypical textbooks. And this is really one of the, this is the first slide, which I wanted just to share with you. It, um, it's taken from a, a primary um, textbook, but it, it just gives you, I think, um, uh, an idea of what, of how textbooks in Italy uh, still uh, look like. Um, so I've, I've just translated for you um, the, the, the Italian here. So this is taken from um, uh, um, a, a history uh, book, which asks children to observe and reflect. Um, it's important for you to know that if you, if, if, if some of you maybe are not familiar with Italian, that uh, Italian has, um, you know, feminine and, and, and masculine, uh, it uses the feminine and masculine. So it's, it's a very kind of uh, gender biased language, uh, in, uh, so to speak, where the uh, male is the dominant um, uh, form used even to address um, girls and uh, women or groups of females. Um, so here we have uh, the idea of um, uh, asking the children to observe uh, three characters. Which one is the historian? It's using the male all the time. How can you tell? So in your opinion, uh, who could a historian be compared to? And the three options are all uh, male options. So um, as you can see from the pictures, there is absolutely no uh, mention of um, girls or, or men, uh, uh, girls, sorry, or, or, or women who are who are able to, to have the same roles. So it's just one small example of, of how textbooks today still um, are very much um, um, biased uh, and, and, and stereotypical in terms of their representations of women and men. So the teachers who participated in this in the um, in the project um, right from the start were uh, aware of of how uh, needed it was to address uh, gender equality issues in schools. Um, we worked together uh, in the summer, so they were actually on their holidays when they came together. Uh, this is uh, some pictures of them working right uh, in the very early stages uh, of um, developing the first uh, charter mark, the gender quality charter mark so a group of teachers from the pilot schools together with experts um, gender and also gender equality and also educational um, specialists who work and they chose to work on uh, some areas of uh, the, the, the charter mark as it was in in those uh, in, the, in the first stages um, so with regarding themselves as teachers they wanted to look at how to incorporate gender equality into their teaching they wanted to increase their uh, awareness and knowledge of gender equality so uh, they really were asking us for um, teacher training on these issues uh, regarding students 
um, they identified the importance of analyzing textbooks together with their students uh, for them to deconstruct uh, these um, uh, these images um, of, uh, of of how men and, and women are portrayed, uh, as well as in other learning materials. And they also wanted to focus very much on uh, relationships uh, between boys and girls, between boys and boys, girls and girls, um, um, putting a, a, an emphasis on on the the importance of respecting each other. With regarding the actual school um, model, uh, they wanted to work on leadership, they wanted to work on involving families more, um, and um, the moment when uh, schools, um, uh, sorry, uh, students have to choose the next school that they go to, um, so moving from one school to another, whether, whether, whether it's from primary to lower secondary or lower secondary to, to upper secondary, um, to, to, even today in Italy it's very much uh, gender stereotype these choices um, as well as career guidance so these were the, the issues that they um, uh, they, they chose uh, in in two thousand back in two thousand and seventeen, and then together Oxfam with uh, the University of Florence, we we worked to support them. Uh, we delivered, for example, some teacher training at the beginning of the school year, which was very important because then they opened up. There was um, the, this uh, small number of of, uh, of teachers then opened up um, the opportunities, the training opportunities, um, also to uh, the wider school uh, and to colleagues not only. From their own schools but from for example the feeder schools or from uh from from other schools so they all work together and also to plan uh, the years um the years work uh, which they wanted to to do uh, in their in their schools um and this was um this was really uh incredible then to come back and see uh the results of what they actually did so uh when using this tool um and i will show you in just a few minutes i'll show you how it, it now looks like in italy but when using this gender equality charter mark um what they managed to achieve having pinpointed what it what it was that they wanted to work on and planning uh, how they were going to work on this on, on the various levels, uh, they came up with some uh, extremely positive uh, uh, results, which had a great impact um, on their teaching, on their students' learning, uh, on, the, on, the, on the school's ethos, uh, and on many other aspects. So just to give you some very uh, quick examples of, of what happened, which you'll be able to uh, read when you also have a copy of this, uh, of this book. Um, so um, one of the teachers in one of the pilot schools uh, came up with this idea, which she has continued to do since then. So um, many years that she's been repeating this at the beginning of the school year. She, um, we're talking about um, lower secondary schools, so uh, students from 14 to 16 uh, years old. At the beginning of the school year, uh, she uh, cuts out of card a magnifying glass and she gives the she gives one to each of her students uh, and it becomes their uh, gender magnifying glass and so any uh, kind of activity that they're doing at any moment during the school day whether they're in a lesson whether they're uh, at, in during break uh, whether they're you know um, talking discussing uh, as a class or with their friends they can take out this uh, uh, magnifying glass and use their gender sensitive lens to look at that given issue or at that given subject, um, at that given argument, a discussion or whatever it is. And she has had incredible, and she still um, talks to me about uh, the insights that uh, students, boys and girls uh, have when they use this lens, uh, uh, analyzing uh, uh, different aspects of the, of the, of the school day um, so just one example another example was a calendar i just wanted to show you uh, sorry here um, this was a calendar which um, the students uh, created um, they used different articles from the italian constitution um, with a with a gender equality uh, again um, critical perspective as well as other gender issues and so they created the, the every single month they dedicated to a special gender um, equality issue um, they researched it, they, they created the, 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 the design, they looked for the pictures, whatever it was. Um, they 
printed this calendar, uh, sold it in the Christmas market to their families, uh, and it became a huge topic of discussion. Many of the families were talking to the teachers, um, above all mums, but also dads, uh, who had had discussions, who had brought up a lot of their own personal um, histories and personal stories and personal experiences um, connected to gender equalities and what um, mums and dads were doing or not doing in the household, what um, grandparents were doing, what the children wanted to do. So a lot of uh, really, um, you know, uh, stimulating uh, discussions uh, and, and raising awareness in the wider community. Um, there was a teacher who worked in, in um, a, a very similar to, to, to some of the work that Dori has been doing recently in her book um, to reversing the roles of some very famous um, uh, children's stories like uh, Cinderella became Cinderella and uh, Pinocchio became Pinocchia. And um, they asked the, the children, uh, the boys in, uh, especially, uh, to change the perspectives on gender stereotypes and how they impact us all and, and how we're not so aware of them. So um, great, uh, uh, great critical analysis analysis coming out of, of these, um, uh, uh, these, these stories. And uh, one last aspect, uh, just one last example, um, was um, looking at um, leadership. So how the school changed some of its um, policy documents and, and, and communication uh, with uh, parents and, and with colleagues, with teaching staff. Uh, there is um, a uh, co-responsibility pact in Italy, uh, which is a document, um, an official document, which establishes a criteria for mutual uh, collaboration between families and schools highlight, and they incorporated the importance of gender equality in this co-responsibility pact in, in one particular school. Um, so as a result, there were target meetings uh, carried out with, uh, with families, with, uh, with teachers uh, and with students, as well as with their parents. Um, so uh, here, this, this quote comes from one of the schools, um, uh, an Italian female student who said, at the beginning of this school year, our Italian teacher welcomed us saying, welcome back girls. So she used the, the Italian um, uh, plural female form rather than the masculine form, which is always used even when addressing uh, girls and boys. Uh, and the males protested uh, and said that this led to a discussion on gender discrimination and sex sexist language. It was very important and I am grateful to our teacher. She made us understand above all, she made the boys understand how it is difficult to feel as if you don't exist. Okay, so there's just very uh, small but concrete examples which I wanted to share with you uh, in, uh, uh, with regards to, to what we've been, um, what happened in, uh, uh, during, what happened in Italy during those, um, those, those years of our, of our project, um, which the book uh, witnesses. Um, what has happened since then? So we've come actually a long way and, I, and I'm very happy that we've managed to, to keep working uh, on these issues with the schools. Those school pilot schools have continued their work. We've managed to bring in others. In Italy, uh, the gender equality charter mark uh, was called GAPS. Um, so it's like uh, gender equalities in schools, that's the acronym. In. And um, we carried on working in the second uh, phase of the European project. So from three pilot country countries uh, working with three pilot schools, we uh, became nine countries working on and expanding the gender equality charter mark. Um, in Italy, we came up with a pre-primary, a primary, a secondary school um, charter mark. So we have uh, two versions, three versions, um, which are uh, which can be used by schools. Um, and it very much uh, promotes this um, um, whole school approach, which is, as uh, Dori was saying, the, the five macro levels, uh, which is very important for us uh, to be working on. So um, this is the website where we have brought everything together. And I just wanted to finish by showing it to you, uh, if I can, just for one second. Um, here it is. So um, I'll, I'll put this in the chat if the, um, just for, for anyone who, who is listening from Italy. Uh, unfortunately, it's all in Italian, so I'm going to have to just uh, translate it very, very briefly. 
um, but it's a it's a website which is dedicated for schools. Um, so anyone who wants to look at gender equality um, and needs to have some uh, guidance uh, can can come here and here they will find. Um, just uh, here it says this is the gender equality charter mark in, in Italian. There's a manual. Uh, this manual um, is like a, a guide for how to use the charter mark. Here you can, if you click here, you will see the um, the charter mark for pre-primary and primary schools. Uh, and here, this is for secondary schools. I, I will open it for you in just a second. Just wanted to scroll down and see and show you what else is here in this website. Um, so lots of case studies, ideas um, and support materials uh, for teachers or, or anyone who wants to look at these issues on uh, in, in these uh, different schools on the five um, uh, macro kind of themes of leadership curriculum, physical environment, relationships and attitudes and uh, communities. Uh, so when you go down, you can find lots of uh, case studies, um, uh, materials, teaching materials, learning materials. Uh, just to finish, um, what the uh, actual um, Chattermark looks like if you if you click on that button, uh, what you will see is um, a very simple um, a tool. Sorry, just one second. I think I have to do it like this. Um, can you see that? No. Just uh, let me just go back. Uh, what you can see is a very simple tool um, which allows us. Mm, mm, as uh, uh, Dori was explaining, allows stu um, teachers, um, students as well. Uh, you can be used by students, it can be used by the leadership team, it can be used by, by many uh, uh, different um, uh, people within the school community. Um, and it's divided into uh, the area, so leadership, the category, uh, for example, developing the charter mark or looking at staff, uh, the different levels that Dori was mentioning, the school uh, teachers and, and students. And then there is a, a very simple question that just to, 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 to get the, 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 the teachers, the staff to start thinking about where they are at, as Dori was mentioning before. In Italy, um, we, we just changed it so there isn't the, the bronze, silver, gold anymore. We just, just changed it very briefly to, to uh, very slightly to one, two, three. And if you click on, uh, on that, uh, it will give you a um, it will give you a, a level, okay. And then when you go onto the the second uh, sheet in the bottom, uh, this opens up. So if you're in level one uh, and you have uh, received between nine and fifteen points, it gives you um, a whole series of recommendations, ideas, suggestions of how you could then work with your school, with your colleagues, with your uh, leadership teams, uh, what you could be doing on a very practical level in your schools. Um, I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you once again to everyone for giving me this great opportunity. I hope that um, uh, what I have said has uh, given you an idea of how we work. I just wanted also to finish by saying that um, this in Italy has also led to a collaboration with INDIRE, which is the Ministry of uh, Education's National Institute for uh, Documentation, Innovation, and Educational Research. So uh, they have been interested in the work that we have done with the Charter Mark in uh, in uh, the Gender Equality Charter Mark in Italy, and they will um, the, the 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 intent is to to work together for them to monitor the impact that schools can have um, on on uh, on improving their gender equality in these uh, five areas with this whole school approach. Um, and, and to provide uh, some concrete uh, case studies and some concrete support to, to teachers on a, on a nationwide level. So um, I think this is it, it's because that, that as, as Peter has said, and as you have um, probably begun to, to, to see that there's really an extensive lot of research uh, and hard work which has uh, provided these um, effective results. So thank you very much. Thank you, Aretha. <clears throat> Sorry, just um, I would just like to make one comment uh, that I, I, I was really so impressed by the Italian work. I think that the Italian schools and the Italian teachers yeah. were the most um, active and enthusiastic mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. committed in the in the project. They were much more um, so than than yeah. either the English or the Hungarian um, counterparts. 
That's so true. it was really yeah. exciting all the work that you did. I just want one short comment about the picture, the first picture you showed from the book. Uh, I wonder if you noticed that there was this prehistoric man naked, but with uh, genitals blurred. So like it's it's so interesting that the that the the gender representation is so distorted, but also like the biological uh, representation is so distorted because because of trying to keep sexuality out of school. I mean, as far as adults obviously think that that's very sexual to uh, show somebody's genitals. Uh, so that was that was a very interesting picture that would be worth a separate discussion. But um, let's move on. Uh, Maria, would you like to continue yeah, with, yeah. with some, um, some thoughts about, you know, what happened yeah, with sure, your, sure. your experiences? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, there's two things that I'd like to highlight. I mean, first of all, uh, um, what um, Aretha presented was fascinating. Like you said, I mean, we were impressed with the work that um, Italy did. Uh, it, 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 I mean, they engaged, you know, in an amazing way, uh, both the schools, the NGOs, and we highlighted that in the book. Um, now, I want to focus very briefly, because I'm conscious of time, on two issues. Um, well, three, actually. I mean, the first one is about the contingency of of gender uh, difference, and more generally, and also of gender equality. The other issue is around context, and by context, I mean uh, the school context and the country context. And last but not least, I want to talk very briefly about positionality, the positionalities of, of the, the researchers. So uh, as I think Dori and Aretha have already uh, discussed that, the different, you know, the, the made reference to the different national context. So at the time of the research, I mean, the, the Italian, the Hungarian context was, was particularly aggressive against gender equality, anything that had to do with the promotion of gender and gender difference. I mean, the UK had a different position, and by no means I'm suggesting that it was a better context, because there were challenges in the UK. I think what we've seen in the last years in the UK is, um, you know, we've been bombarded with gender equality accreditation schemes uh, in, in primary schools, but also in secondary, and particularly in higher education. And we've got all these audit tools, you know, gender accreditation, we've got, you know, race accreditation, equality schemes. I mean, there's also a lot of criticism you know, coming from some very distinguished academics like, you know, Sarah Ahmed, that, you know, was talking about racism or, you know, gender doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, gender equality is achieved. So there's quite a lot around, you know, the non-performativity of racism and, you know, in relation to gender and sexism. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to clarify that by no means we use, you know, the UK, the England as kind of the normative um, uh, context or, you know, the, the, uh, the guide for our work. Uh, I mean, on the contrary, you know, we wanted our work to be very, uh, very sensitive to context, very sensitive to national differences, and also very sensitive and aware of the implications of different epistemic traditions, uh, well, the epistemic traditions that we worked in, uh, but also um, the implications of language and the implications of using, you know, language, English, as, as the language of communication within European projects. Um, so, uh, as, as far as positionality is concerned, then again, that could be, you know, a, a, an issue for, for, for a talk, <laughs> just a separate issue for a talk. Um, just wanted to say that, you know, um, as the research lead, I mean, I, I obviously had a, a very unusual position in the sense that, you know, I, I'm a migrant, you know, Greek-born British migrant academic. Uh, who has done experience, who has done work on gender equality across national, different national contexts in Europe, in the Middle East, um, Africa, and, and India. Um, so, uh, I mean, what has stood out for me was that actually what I noticed in terms of what I realized in terms of gender equality across schools was across schools and national contexts, Hungary, Italy and the UK, was not, that not a lot had changed since 1996 when I actually uh, did my doctoral research in, in Greece, in a secondary school in Greece. And I thought that was shocking. 
and that was very, very disappointing. So although there were differences across schools, like for example, in England, I mean, we included schools in the north and we included schools um, you know, in London and outside um, London. So of course there were differences. Um, and again, I, you know, I'm not going to use the word better or worse in terms of gender equality, but I think what stood out is that is, you know, how um, what um, how gender was shaped obviously was different and configured, but also the intersections uh, of various strands of diversity uh, took different forms and shapes. So in a school with a predominantly um, a Muslim population, of course, what stood out was, you know, the racialization of gender and the gendering of, of religion. Uh, in another school, uh, I mean, the intersections of sexuality with gender uh, was, you know, one of the most prominent uh, findings. And uh, unfortunately, I can't go into detail in, in findings, but if we have some time or uh, any questions, I'm happy to do, uh, to do that. So, um, I mean, gender-based violence was 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 an issue that was you know prevalent. I mean, a problem that was prevalent in all schools and in all countries. Um, now, I mean, of course, there were different forms and uh, uh, of and performances of gender-based violence. But I think what we've noticed, what we've realised that you know was happening and was quite prominent across schools and across countries, was this you know normalisation uh, of gender-based violence. Uh, which again, you know, was was shocking. Um, uh, so I can't think of anything else at this um, at this point, um, uh, Dory. Um, yeah, I think that's that's okay. It. Thanks. Okay, I will just um, <clears throat> try to summarize some perhaps interesting points about the Hungarian experiences. Uh, I think which were quite different in a sense from both the English and the Italian experiences. Um, we had a very, very hard time finding schools in the first place. Um, and this is in a great part, I think, due to the, the, um, the anti-gender um, discourse or propaganda or what should I call it it's 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 it has been growing stronger and stronger since uh, 2010 when when the current uh, government was first uh, elected into a two-thirds two majority and and they joined into this this anti-gender movement uh, almost immediately of, you know starting with changing the curricula making it, extremely traditionalist um, in the sense of gender relations and so on. Um, and, also, and gradually in public speech, it, it, it started to appear that there is this gender ideology, uh, the representatives of which want to, uh, you know, corrupt children and they want to make everybody homosexual and they want to uh, eliminate genders all together so everybody can be any gender any days um, i'm not exaggerating this is like part of official uh, discourse and this this has influenced uh, we we really tried to approach we contacted about 30 or 40 schools in all over the country we really wanted different schools and we ended up with three elite schools in, in Budapest, uh, like high schools, like prestigious high schools, um, because they were the only ones that let us in with such a topic. Um, I had experienced this difficulty before um, trying to do gender uh, research in schools earlier. Uh, and I think probably now it's even worse. So I, I can't imagine that we could we could go into any school uh, saying that we want to research some gender related topic here. So so that was that was one challenge. Um, but eventually, so even though we we didn't manage to find very diverse schools, we we did find some some interesting things uh, about how teachers and students relate to, to gender equality in these uh, schools. And, and it's, it's probably, it, to some extent, it can be generalized uh, to a broader context. 
Um, so what, what we noticed uh, was that th there are totally incoherent attitudes to, to, to gender, gender equality and, and gender relations, uh, which comes from, so it, it comes, it, it's, it comes together from, from there's this belief uh, in, in gender complementarity that, you know, that men are like this, women are like that, and they complement each other, and the world is uh, a nice, harmonious whole. Um, even teachers who, who in other ways are very progressive, and they, 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 they think of themselves as, as liberal educationists, uh, they, they have, uh, many of them have this uh, idea about genders. Uh, they also, as, as, as they are self-defined liberal and progressive schools, they, they unreflexively uh, possess this uh, neoliberal idea that um, you can be anything, you know, whatever you want. Um, and this is a this is a very individualistic approach. And when when <clears throat> these um, and, and and also the the liberal concept of diversity is is very present. And when these these come together, then uh, <clears throat> then the result is that that um, there is this very ambivalent uh, idea about uh, about gender equality. For example, if we talk about gender based violence. This individualist approach uh, can can lead to victim blaming and like relativizing, you know, adolescent boys' violent behavior as something uh, relativizing and biologizing. So we we very often heard uh, things like, oh yeah, yeah, these some of these boys are like running around testosterone bo bombs, you know, and they just can't control their behavior, and so on. Uh, and anyway, why why are those girls dressed like that? So this kind of I'm, I'm sure you you have heard all this before. So <laughs> these are familiar uh, discourses. Uh, so a lot of trivialization of of gender based violence um happens and and the other thing is that um very often what was important was was very often um teachers said that so they kind of blamed it on the family so they didn't really um they for example with subject and career choice uh a lot of teachers said that that um we don't do any gender-based discrimination here. We, we support uh, all the children to become whatever they want, but they bring these traditionalist views from their family. And then there was, there was no reflection in the school. Or there was no um, <clears throat> attempt to maybe question these, uh, you know, these ideas that were coming from the family. Uh, <clears throat> And what was also interesting was that um, very often when we interviewed, especially uh, students, so these, these are these are like really uh, prestigious high schools. There's a very strong school community, and when we were trying to critique gender relations uh, in the focus groups with with uh, students very often they were very protective about their schools and, and very defensive and they, they, uh, <clears throat> they didn't want to, to criticize their schools, uh, even though in, in individual conversations, other students were very critical about their teachers' gendered behavior, for example. So that was an interesting th uh, thing, like one of the, all the schools got a, a kind of bronze award in the charter mark, which means that uh, individual teachers that are trying to do some things, but, but it's not institutionalized. And in one of the schools, the, the students uh, in, the, in the second focus group, when we, were, we went back to the schools, as Maria mentioned, to see the impact of the GECM, they were very offended that they, they only got the bronze. And 
how come when this is the, the most wonderful school in the country and when teachers do their best really and there is no gender inequality and so on. So these were um, really interesting. And just going back to what I said that there was this really incoherent ambivalent attitude to, to gender relations that's respected reflected by 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 the by the bigger social environment because there is this um, anti-gender discourse which i mentioned which is getting stronger and stronger but at the same time in the everyday reality gender relations have been changing a lot so so i i, I don't think they are the same as, as as they were like 20 or 30 years ago and and this creates probably in a lot of people, the kind of ambivalence, like what's really going on. So on the one hand, you, you see women and men acting and living in different ways than, than their parents used to. And, and there are different uh, measures of what's fair and equal and, and just. And at the same time, we hear all the time that, uh, you know, all this anti-gender um, uh, <clears throat> talks about, I, I don't want to go into it because um, those of you who know uh, what's happening in Hungary in, in politics uh, know very well that this, this is a very sens sensitive um, time when, 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 uh, when, when the majority of people gives entitlement to, to this kind of anti-gender discourse that actively discriminates against LGBT people, actively discriminates against, uh, uh, also against women who don't want to follow, um, you know, traditional ideas of traditional um, romanticized um, gender gender roles and gender order. So. Um, and this this already was present in, in yeah about five years ago in the schools and and I do expect that that it it's it's even more more dramatic now um, so this this is not not uh, and 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 for this reason and many other reasons so the te teacher situation in Hungary is really a disaster they are really disrespected underpaid overworked. Gender equality is really uh, the last thing on their list. So they, they were not, not really active. They, they, I don't think that at this stage, uh, the, the level of individual teachers trying to, to work with gender issues has, has changed, even, even in the schools where, where we worked. So it's, it's a longer, longer process, which has to be embedded in a, in a different uh, social environment than we are having now. Um, okay. Yeah, I think that's that's what I would say. Sorry, that, that's, yeah. yeah, that's great. Thank you. Just I'm gonna just say um, um, make a few points very briefly about Italy because I know Aretha spoke quite a lot about you know um, the work with schools and the gender equality charter. Might just to say a little bit about. Uh, some of the findings, um, because I mean, I wrote, I was co, I co-authored also the chapter uh, with uh, with uh, Valentina, um, and I just wanted to share um, something which um, I found fascinating. Actually, um, I mean, I did discuss earlier. I mentioned very briefly the um, intersections of gender and religion in in one of the schools uh, in the UK, particularly this notion of you know the racialization. Of, 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 of gender and the gendering of religion. By religion, I mean Islam, because this is what actually was, was described as a religion <laughs> in the school. But uh, what stood out for me and certainly uh, Valentina for, um, in, in relation to the Italian context was this notion of incompatibility of Italianness um, with Islam. Okay. So it's like, I mean, I, I think, you know, the intersection of gender um, citizenship and religion was very interesting. What, um, you know, we uh, heard from students, but also from teachers is um, that, you know, one, I mean, to put it in simple terms, one cannot really be Italian if one is Muslim. So there was, there was, there were some interesting findings there around, you know, the embodiment of gender um, issues about 
uh, you know, obviously the heads up appearances, appearance, uh, and and really even even references to fashion and what it means to be Italian, which I thought, you know, to be an Italian woman and um, to uh, to be trendy and to engage really to respond, you know, uh, to, um, to to fashion in a way that's creative and 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 inspiring. So I thought that um, that was uh, really fascinating. And I think the other thing that um, I think we've noticed across the three different national contexts was this discrepancy between what is actually said, you know, the very popular discourse of gender equality, which obviously everyone wants to tap into that, you know, oh yes, you know, of course we have a legal framework that supports equality. Oh yeah, we're all, uh, you know, committed to gender equality. And then we see something completely different in, in practice. We see, you know, the very stereotypical um, uh, understandings of gender, but also very stereotypical performances of gender. And that's what I meant earlier when I said, I don't think that has changed, uh, actually, you know, uh, in the last 20 years. And yes, gender relations has changed, have changed, but, um, you know, the stereotypes haven't changed that much. So, and I think this um, uh, engagement or, you know, alignment with the popular discourses of, of, of gender equality, of course, are, you know, so how you know, neoliberal subjects engage uh, with ideas about equality, diversity, and, and difference, but I think that creates a you know huge problems because it may you know we are in a situation where any discussion around uh, inequalities and particularly gender, uh, I think, becomes obsolete or becomes you know irrelevant to um, to education. Um, um, so, um, so yes, I think, you know, there were similarities uh, in, in the findings across the three different countries. Uh, I think, Dory, um, the issue around, I mean, I think the, um, uh, the racialization of, of uh, gender and the gendering or religion did not come out, did not come through the data strongly in Hungary, but I think that was probably because of the choice of schools. Yes. I think there was a small representation of gypsy um, children, is that correct? In one of the schools, but I think uh, the yeah, two schools that were true. chosen were more that's elite just, school, yeah. uh, schools. That was, yeah. the, that was a problem with these kind of schools that that they don't really have students who are not like the mainstream middle class white uh, majority. So so we didn't really have any Roma students. Uh, we wanted to find schools which which have because that would have been very uh, relevant. Um, yeah, but I mean, even like this, a lot of interesting things came out, but 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 it could have changed uh, some of the findings and some of the results if 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 there had been uh, a more diverse set of of schools, obviously, yeah. I think, because um, so in Hungary, the racial issue is, is, I think it's just as important as as in the UK or in Italy. Uh, but uh yeah so so another direction this this research could go forward if there was uh, you know any continuation is 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 somehow finding uh, schools you know average schools and schools with like more in more disadvantaged background because uh the majority of roma people live in disadvantaged backgrounds so uh, to find such schools. I, um, when I was doing my doctoral research, I did find such a school where there was a, a significant amount of, of, uh, of Roma students. And that was very interesting. Um, I, I, was, I was working on, on, on how uh, students constitute their, their various parts of their identity, their gender, their sexuality, their ethnicity, their class through how they talk about their sexuality and their semi sorry and there uh, it was relevant um, <clears throat> whether the which what kind of ethnic belonging the, the students identified with so it would it would be important to to try and and find find such schools.